Dr. Arthur Kovacs, welcome back to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you very much. I enjoyed my experience before. I felt very incomplete, so I'm glad to have a chance to try and talk about some other matters that I think represent my point of view and are, I need to talk about. It's my okay. need. Okay, well, I don't want you to feel very incomplete, and we'll do whatever we can to to rectify that. I know you, you let me know right after the last uh, talk that we had, which was, I think, two weeks ago, that yeah. um, there were two topics in particular that you were concerned about. Um, yes. One was the, what you referred to as the philosophical rot, stupidity, and client yes. evil of psychiatric nomenclature. That's and one. the other was the use of concepts from lifespan developmental psychology to break free from our present medicalization. So let's jump into topic number one, the philosophical no, rock. we're not going to jump into topic one because I realized as I sat down and got ready for this, there's a preamble I have to go through. Okay, preamble away. The preamble is I took a lot of, uh, whenever I could, I went to summer school every summer while I was in college so I could take extra courses that I was interested in. And uh, I took a lot of anthropology and, and philosophy and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with some concepts from cultural anthropology. Okay. Every culture has a problem. Every culture sets forth ways that people are expected to behave, what the esteem pathways are, what the values people should subscribe to, what the interpersonal behaviors they should engage in, what's stigmatized and what's not stigmatized. And in every culture, there's a portion of the population that will not refuses to or cannot conform its behavior to what's expected of them. Okay. And every culture divides those people into two piles. One piles are evil people. They're criminals, and uh, they, they are treated very harshly. They're thrown over cliffs. They're stoned to death. Uh, they're... Uh, they, they need to be purged, uh, either driven out of the clan or killed or, or incarcerated, put away so they can't contaminate and keep doing their foul acts to the rest of the population. Right. The other half are called mad. Uh, the, those people are given a sort of semi-pass. They're held not quite as responsible for what they're doing. And usually there is an attempt made to try and rehabilitate them, uh, that some somebody should try and get them over whatever this handicap is that they're struggling with. Uh, and and uh, there have been different people entrusted with this mission. Uh, for the longest time, it was usually religious figures who were uh, uh, given the mission of trying to uh, get the badness out of them, and, and with chanting, with uh, exorcisms uh, with, with trepanning in, uh, in South American countries where a hole would be cut in the skull and the, so the evil spirits could uh, come out. Uh, and these were people in the religious orders who were asked to do that. And that, uh, that, that assignment to uh, religious people to cure the uh, supposed uh, crazy people went on and on and on through the Enlightenment and into the Renaissance. But with the rise of science, then attention started. And uh, uh, people who were now becoming physicians started to feel like they ought to be given the responsibility. And uh, there was tension. There were institutions uh, run by the clergy, uh, sanctuaries and retreat places for for the mentally ill, and physicians started to establish hospitals for them. And as the Enlightenment continued, and as the rise of science continued, almost all responsibility now has been lodged in, in the house of medicine. Right. medicine uh, med medical practitioners of one sort or another are the ones to whom those who have lessened responsibility because they're mad and not bad are in, uh, sent over to care. So that has spilled over powerfully. Uh, psychologists could have stayed out of that. Uh, when the profession was founded in the 1940s by the federal government, 
we could have continued to declare ourselves as applied psychologists trying to do some kind of counseling with troubled people and not embrace the medical model. But there was great fear that we could not compete. If people could go and see uh, physicians or psychiatrists under their health plans, and about 80% of it would be paid by this very liberal health insurance that existed in the 40s and 50s, then why would anybody go see a psychologist and have to pay out of pocket for it? So those of us who are in the leadership of this young profession started to fight for the right to be get included in health care plans. We thought that that was the only way we could guarantee that the profession would continue to flourish and grow and take up its rightful place in the culture. And I think we sold our soul to the devils. That's what we did. It was a I, I always want to expiate that error I made and the sin I feel that I committed by joining that movement to make that happen. Yeah, a movement. That's, that's such a... a uh, in a way, a strange thing to hear from somebody who for many years was so prominent in APA. Well, I was prominent in APA, but I changed my tune when I began to reflect Did you? ways that I'm thinking about. Did you raise I, some hell in APA? Pardon me? Did you raise some hell in APA? I did. I, I was even a part of a task force on uh, trying to change psychiatric nomenclature. I was part of a task force on exploring how psychologists could get out of the healthcare system and uh, establish itself once again with its older identity as applied psychologists rather than as healthcare providers. We had to declare ourselves as healthcare providers in order to get the insurance reimbursement. And that, that was horrible. And I think we made a terrible mistake. It did good things short term. Professional schools were founded. There was a great cultural demand uh, to participate in this enterprise and students showed up in huge numbers and the culture did recognize us and provide slots for us in public and private settings and in independent practice but gradually we saw as i said we had sold our souls to the devil and the insurance companies uh, third-party payers gradually have taken away our autonomy and now dictate to us what kinds of work we should do and who's going to get paid what for what right, and right. most of my colleagues are trapped in that system and yeah. can't get free so so, that, so so does that uh does that cover the philosophical rot stupidity and client evil of psychi psychiatric nomenclature the psychiatric nomenclature almost uh, the existence of the profession of psychology, its nomenclature, and what we are now beset with is an example, uh, using my philosophy hat, is an example of the reductionist fallacy. Uh, the reductionist fallacy holds that the solution to the mind-body problem which has existed since the early Greek philosophers, what is the relationship between the mind and body? The solution to that problem is to understand that the body is preeminent, that behavior, thoughts, feeling states are nothing but manifestations of actions going on in the body, and real science, real control, and real progress will only be made by studying bodily processes and learning ways to intervene in those bodily processes because that's where the action really is. And the other is like just froth on the waves of the bodily processes. And yeah, the, I'm wondering, you know, things, uh, B.F. Skinner was famous for talking about uh, the inner world as the black box. And that all we need, you know, we were never going to understand the black box we could only look at stimulus in and behavior out. Well, the psychiatrists now saying with their, their imaging capacities and the advances in their technology, yes, they can look inside the black box. Right. And they are now manipulating things that are going on inside the black box. And doesn't that, in fact, have some implications for psychotherapy? No. No. What are the implications for psychotherapy? The implications for psychotherapy is that the sales job is being done in the culture because not only is the psychiatric profession leading this march, but most policymakers, most decision makers, and the general public itself is in the throes of this madness that the, that the reductionist fallacy is correct. 
And besides, there is an agitation in the public now. They want short-term term everything. They, they want short-term conversations, quick texts, and they want to take a pill if they can in order to make themselves feel better. So yeah. we are drowning in uh, the consequences of this point of view. F funding for research, funding for pro new programs is, are all being driven by this philosophy. Okay. That the body leads and everything else will fall in place. Now, the philosophers of science say that the question itself is a non-question. Uh, we can conceptualize all kinds of things. So we can conceptualize the question, what is the relationship between the mind and body? Just as we can conceptualize, how would one take care of a unicorn? That doesn't mean that it's a useful question to ask. And... Most philosophers of science say the following, that you can analyze anything at, at increasing or, or decreasing scope, scale, and complexity. We can start with the universe. We can, if we had a device that would allow us to see the extensity of the universe, it would be wonderful to look at it. We could move towards our galaxy in the universe. We could move towards our planet. We could move down and start looking at the Earth itself. We could come closer and look at masses of people interacting in traffic jams and things that are taking place on the Earth. We could move down and, and focus on a single person and uh, see that person's interactions with other people. If we had the right de device, we could go inside the person and we could begin to see how organs and the brain functions and the heartbeats and everything else was happening inside the person from moment to moment. We could go down to the next level and we could because everything in our body is composed of linked molecules. We could we could see all the molecules that we're composed of and where the linkages are. We could move down between below that and we start looking at individual atoms that we could pick on and look at, and we could look at the electrons and neutrons. And if the string theorists are, are correct, we could even move down and see string vibrating uh, inside a human being. Uh, and we could say any one of these is the real cause of what's going on. And we have sciences. We have sciences of cosmology. We have science, sciences of the earth. We have eco ecological sciences. We have cultural anthropology that talks about large groups. We have group psychology that talks about small groups. We have family psychology that talks about a, a particular kind of small group. Then we have individual psychology that most of our colleagues practice. And then we have the psychiatric profession, and it's inside the brain uh, at the next level down. Uh, we certainly have people working on the, uh, the chemistry and, and uh, molecular structure of body parts. I don't know if we have anybody looking at it, how atoms move around inside a human being. Well, but we do have people trying to apply quantum theory ideas to, to psychology and to psychotherapy. I th in my opinion, it's mostly metaphorical. Yes, it is. Yeah. But, you know, so you're talking about, you know, there there are sort of different realms, if you will, conceptually. Yeah, and, mind is inseparable. What about the idea of um, the appropriate level of analysis? So depending upon what you're trying to find out or change, not all of those are going to be, not all those different spheres of, uh, of organization are going to be I, the I tell my students, level. Uh, my graduate students, they should know something about what's happening to ecology and what's causing it because that's a major stressor in people's lives. And they should certainly know something about small, uh, small group uh, interaction. They should know something about family therapy. Mm -hmm. And they should know something about health and medicine uh, because that, that too affects people. But we should stick to our guns. We, sh we should work with human beings. And, with, and not with the biology of human beings. I don't care if the psychiatrists want to do that, but I don't like it that they think that the, that's the answer to the, all questions. It is not. As a matter of fact, we are mind-body, and there, there's a growing body of research that suggests that effective psychotherapy actually, quote, changes brain function, yeah. that different parts of the brain are now activated by effective psychotherapy. 
And I don't like that way of thinking about it. I think that's, that's just as wrong as saying that it's the change in the brain functioning that's uh, producing the different ways of uh, functioning. We, we are seamless. If we live poorly, our physiology is going to get screwed up. And uh, if something happens to screw up our physiology, we're, we are going to, uh, inevitably to be living poorly. Now, it is a reasonable question to ask what kinds of interventions would be most helpful to people at what level? That's a reasonable question to right. ask. Right. Uh, one, of the, one of the most useful interventions would be uh, to change the economy of the United States. Uh, suicide rates would go down. Uh, rates of admission to mental hospitals would go down. There's good, good ecological research on what happens when the economy is out of whack. It stresses people in terrible ways, and they react poorly to it. So that's probably the most powerful intervention. We should give up being psychologists and all go back to school and become accountants, because if we want to have greater impact on, on or politicians or politicians, or politicians, yes, changing policies would yeah, help, or act, or, or activists advocating for that, and the, you know, then we get into an area that was called radical psychiatry. Yes. Uh, it, it yes. wasn't called radical psychology. Maybe it should have been called radical psychology. I love that when the, when psychiatry was interested in other things. Not, now I'll get down to psychiatric nomenclature. Okay. It is, after all, a way of putting some kind of label on a single human being. It, it doesn't pay much attention at all to what that human being is embedded in. Who are the relatives and friends that that person interact with? What's the quality of life from the occupational path that that person is on? And it, it acts as if everything that's happening to this person is somehow embedded in processes that's taking place within the person. It's not an interactual look at much of anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, second of all, it poses as a science, but it's not a science at all. It is a strange, strange thing. It is a labeling process. Uh, one would think that the labels emerge out of empirical research, but they don't. They, the labels started because psychiatrists across the country knew that if they were referring somebody to somebody in another city, uh, how could they, in a quick way, say something that would be uh, in, really informative to somebody else. Uh, the nomenclature that existed in the 1940s was primarily uh, psychoanalytic nomenclature because psychiatry was a uh, psychoanalytic profession then. And the inner judge reliability, some psychologists did research on this. What's the inner judge reliability on psychiatric labels? It was down in the 20%. I mean, uh, there was huge confusion and non-clarity. So the psychiatric profession took the research seriously, and each iteration of the DSM has been an attempt to increase inner judge reliability, and probably that's useful. But how do they do it? They debate, and they take votes. Nobody <laughs> in any science decides what the solution is by taking votes on possible solutions. Their empirical research drives the whole enterprise. It makes very clear what of various uh, uh, possibilities and hypotheses can be supported by uh, the best advances in empirical research. Psychiatry is the only pseudoscience that I know of that settles all matters of dispute between psychiatrists by having large committees and subcommittees that work on it and take votes eventually about whether they like the product they're generating. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, and in the end, the American Psychiatric Association Board of Directors takes the final vote on whether the proposed text really meets the needs of psychiatrists. So it is not scientific at all. And the inner judge reliability has gotten up to be about 45%, and that's not very great either. So I am not impressed. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> the third thing I hate about it is... It is, uh, it, it is a commercial product. Uh, it, it's not a scientific description of, quote, illnesses. It is a nomenclature that allows all citizens of the United States to come see a psychiatrist and get reimbursed by a third-party payer. 
I don't believe there's anybody who shows up in a psychiatrist's waiting room that there's not something in the DSM that could be stuck on that person as a label. And that person then, uh, the psychiatrist can then bill the insurance company for the services. So 100% of the American population has a nervous or mental disorder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we all, uh, you know, we all suffer the, the slings of outrageous fortune. We all have stuff that we're dealing with, right? Is, issues. The, the the next complaint is that there, uh, well, there are sections of the ICD-10CM. Most of them are on physical health and uh, physical medicine. Uh, if you uh, want to repair a, uh, a ruptured appendix, there is a protocol to be followed. You first give the person a general anesthetic, then there's a certain place in the body you cut open, you cut through the external tissue and the fatty tissue and the muscle, and then you snip the uh, burst appendix out of the cavity, you lavage the cavity with the antibiotics, and then you systematically close the wound again and with stitches or clamps, and you prescribe a, 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 an antibiotic regimen for some days afterwards. Each one of the diagnoses on the medical side has a very clear protocol to be followed. There are no protocols to be followed whatsoever in the psychiatric nomenclature. It's a naming exercise without a prescribed uh, course of what you do. Well, therefore, that kind of perhaps led the, the movement of, uh, of manualized psychotherapy, that to be able to spell out the steps such that a person could kind of read step one, two, three, if, the, you know, if somebody's suffering from say, obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah. if we this, play, this, and this. If we psychi psychiatric associations nomenclature, then we also buy into that attempt. We have to try and specify a protocol that's being used uh, that is generally, by scientific evidence, shown will be the correct way to deal with this label that we've affixed to them. And I think that's a fool's errand. Uh, the, the psychiatrists are not interested in working on manualized psychotherapy. They, with the help of Big Pharma, they think they're going to find a pill that's going to take care of everything. Every one of those entries in the DSM will have some pill to follow or maybe magne magnetic uh, shock treatment or real shock treatment. Some kind of physical thing will be prescribed for every one of those things. Someday we will get there, and I think that's madness. Okay, okay. And of course, we're painting with a very broad bat, uh, brush here because I've spoken to lots of psychiatrists who probably agree with much of what you're saying <laughs> in terms of treatment. That's like the people who don't like Trump but won't speak up in public. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the other thing I don't like about it is it's culture bound. That is a list of things uh, that people in North America is not, not, not supposed to experience or engage in. It's horribly culturally uh, bound. We, we now get down to some things like uh, uh, you, you have a uh, major depressive episode if your spouse has died and you're crying for more than six months. I forgot what the cutover, cutoff is. Yeah. But there's, oh, there, there's a correct length of time that you're supposed to grieve and you're supposed to get over it in that length of time. And if you don't, you're sick. You have a diagnosable illness. And everything in there is culturally bound. Uh, my favorite example is, uh, suppose you're walking down Broadway on a nice summer afternoon and a black transvestite, very large guy, comes out of an alley and he's cursing and he's calling on everybody to draw around him. And he has uh, had a, a, a visit from the spirit world and he knows what's corrupt and wrong about our culture. And we should all listen to him because terrible things are going to happen if we don't pay attention to the messages he's delivering. Well, the ambulance will come and take him off to Bellevue Hospital very quickly. <laughs> the bystanders will, will, will call the authorities will incarcerate him. If you're doing the same thing on a mountainside and approaching a village in New Guinea, 
and a transvestite comes out of that village and announces the same thing. Everybody gathers around in reverence and wants to kneel and hear what the message is. Now, who's right and who's wrong? I'm not willing to say that we're right and that those people are crazy. Okay. Ah. <laughs> uh. There's one more thing. I, oh, obviously. If you carry a DSM uh, diagnosis, you're stigmatized. Uh, it, 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 also, it also reduces people's willingness to come to a therapist. You have to be crazy and have a diagnosis of a mental disorder in order to come to a therapist. We, we are not consultants on problems of living. We're here to treat disorders. And I, that model... Uh, is a disincentive for the the, uh, uh, the clientele, the public, to come and ask for a visit with us. The American Psychological Association did some market research. Uh, I was on the committee that uh, hired the consulting firm. We went to Ohio and we tried to find out what, if anything, the lay public, that was in the 1980s, knew about the different providers who were eligible for insurance reimbursement, the difference between psychologists, social workers, and uh, the psychiatrists. Oh, by the way, here's a bitch on this side. 85% of all psychiatric diagnosing and dispensing of psychiatric medicines is done by non-psychiatrists. It's done by nurse practitioners and by other forms of psychiatry physicians who have uh, found that there's a lucrative submarket for their practice in uh, writing prescriptions for psychiatric medication. I don't like that either. They've had no training in what they're doing. Uh, so we surveyed the public in Ohio. We picked Ohio because uh, most, country, most companies bring out new products, choose Ohio, because its demographics approximate the demographics of the United States pretty well. Mm. So we found out very clearly some things. Uh, only 20% of the people polled uh, knew the difference between psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers. Right, right. that doesn't uh, surprise me. No, I, it's probably gotten a little bit better, but probably not much better. Uh, of the 20% who did know that there was a difference, uh, they clearly did not want to see psychiatrists. Uh, they, they would resist. If their, if their mother was having dementia, they would take her. But they would try anything to avoid having to go themselves. Maybe if they could go at 2 o'clock in the morning up the dark back stairs of the place so nobody would see them going into the psychiatrist's office, they might be willing to go. Coming to see us or the social workers was much less stigmatized. They were more willing to consider doing that. Their first recourse if they were having trouble was to go see a clergy person. That was their first recourse. But if the clergy... You know, uh, speaking of the stigma, one thing that comes to mind is that many people in private practice have two doors, right? So that the person can leave from a different door than the one that they came in to sort of avoid yeah. being seen. Yes. Something like that, right? Yeah. Something to try to, to, to recognize that there's this stigma and how can we isolate people so that they won't be seen by other people as, oh, I went to see a shrink. Yes. Well, I, I try and get my uh, the people I consult with as much as possible to do two small things to identify, to get over the stigma. Do not rent an office in a medical building. Rent an office in a general purpose office building where there are architects mm -hmm. and accountants and other kinds of folks. So you're with the ordinary folk and you're not a branch of medicine. Yeah. And second of all, don't have on your answering machine, this is so-and-so, I'm not here right now, leave a message and I'll return your call. And if this is an emergency, go to the emergency room. Uh, somehow, we've gotten the idea we're required by law somehow to do that. There's no requirement to say that. That says, I deal with very disturbed people who are going to kill themselves or are going crazy. That's not a good announcement to put out to the public. This, what do you think about coaching, you know? There are psychologists who have credentials to practice as therapists, but mm -hmm. 
but who are now choosing to call themselves coaches instead as an end run around the whole stigma related yeah. to psychotherapy. Well, I, I have a coaching credential myself. I don't use it. I have it because if the march we're on continues to get into worse and worse territory, I have a way out. That's I, your uh, escape hatch. <laughs> for the time being, I'm going to fight to try and free our, our uh, profession from what we've done to ourselves. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I want us to be applied psychologists again. I don't want us to be uh, health practitioners. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, it's an interesting distinction. Can you say more about what's the difference between an applied psychologist and a health practitioner? There's, there's no, uh, I'm not part of the medical establishment. I, I do not provide health services. Okay. And I, now this is a good lead in because now I can talk about my first topic. If you ask me what I am, I am an applied developmental psychologist. Mm -hmm. And and so, what does that unpack that for us? What what all does that imply? I have to do uh, over the years of my life, uh, one of the things I've been asked to do is teach developmental psychology. So, I immerse myself a lot in the literature of developmental psychology, and there are two resources that uh, are so powerful and so wonderful. They gave me an aha experience. They can be used to come up with an assessment of what's troubling a client, and they can be used to formulate what, what the correct way of topics to talk to the person about that would be helpful in healing. So I have not only a way to do an evaluation and come up with, quote, I, I don't want to call it a diagnosis, come up with an assessment of what the problems are and identify what the likely underlying problems are but I also have things to do with the client. They're, in contrast to the DSM, uh, if you understand developmental psychology, there are obvious things that you must discuss with the client and ways to relate to the client that flow from it. There is a protocol that can be designed. So what are the two, uh, I'm not sure if you said they were books or theories or... One is Eric Erickson on Eric his, Erickson, with his yeah. life and developmental psychology. I have been arrogant enough working with a, a seminar of my graduate students who devoured everything he's ever written to think he was wrong, that they're not just eight stages of human development. There are ten. We added two more. Mm -hmm. uh, I can hold up a graphic. Maybe you can see this. I don't know. Where is it? Damn. Here it is. I don't know if this is it. You can see this. I don't think I'd be able to read it. Uh, the, I, can see that, I can see that it's uh, boxes. With there are, there are five them. boxes down here and there are five boxes up here. Well, read them to us. And, and the boxes are, this is like a staircase. Okay. Uh, the lowest one at the bottom is his first stage, trust versus mistrust. Uh, that lasts until about uh, the power of it, the importance of it, begins to get overshadowed as, as the child begins to be able to locomote and stand up and walk and begin to explore the world on his own. It gives way to the second stage, autonomy versus shame and doubt. That becomes the critical central feature of the child's life. Uh, moving on to that, that uh, at age uh, three, four, five, somewhere in there, Initiative versus guilt becomes the next stage. And then uh, with the entry into preschool and school, industry versus inferiority comes on. And finally, all during adolescence, identity versus role confusion takes place. Now, each one of these stages, if the previous stage has gotten screwed up and there are bad wounds from it, it's hard to go on and master the content of the, the, the oncoming stage. Yeah. So I'm already telling you how I use this. Uh, if I identify where it seems like the person is wounded from the kind of preoccupations that person has and the kinds of ways the person's relating to me, I always think, all right, here's where forward motion seems to have gotten clogged up 
What was the immediate stage right before that? There's probably been damage at the immediate stage. So I'm already planning what I need to talk to the yeah. person. About. Now, this is not totally unlike psychoanalysis. I mean, oh, psychoanalysis this... also gives us a developmental scheme, right? Yes. I don't, I don't like uh, the psychosexual developmental scheme. I don't think it's a good one. Uh, at the end of age, uh, stage five, identity versus role confusion, my line moved off to the side, and then there were five more stairs that went up. The, the moving off to the side is, this is when uh, separation from the family takes place. The person is bro born out into the world with much more responsibility for directing and managing his or her life, and then the next five challenges come on. The first one is intimacy versus isolation, because intimacy has been provided up until then by membership in the family. Now the person has to create other ways of satisfying the human need for intimacy. Then there are two stages we've added that come on in the 30s and early 40s, role flexibility versus role rigidity. In today's complicated culture, it takes people somewhere between 30 and 40 to put together their life in a way that they feel like it's not perfect. There are many things that are still fucked up, but they're, they're managing it reasonably well. Uh, when kids come in in their 20s, they're still lost and confused. Uh, so they put things together, and then all you can count on once you've settled on who you are, how you're going to provide for yourself, who are the people you're going to relate to, are you going to have a spouse or remain single, are you gay or straight, when those things have been resolved, the only thing you can count upon is that fate is going to throw some kind of grenade into your life and everything that you have been used to doing will get blown up in some way. <laughs> the simplest and most common example is the decision to have a baby. Uh, <laughs> that disrupts everything the, the couple has been doing with each other. Yeah. Everything has to be reworked and renegotiated. Yeah. That's a space for the new arrival. So those who are rigid in their roles, they have to go on doing things like they've always done versus those who have role, role flexibility have different outcomes uh, when this happens. The next stage is uh, social engagement versus so, social detachment. Uh, we have altruism in us. We are egocentric and we are altruistic. After we have worked out putting our lives together in a reasonable fashion or making them work well, we look about and need to engage with the greater world. We need to start volunteering somewhere. We need to find some social cause. If we don't do that, we, we're in trouble. We start withering. Alfred Adler wrote about this. He thought mo most neurosis was due to a lack of social interest. And it becomes critical in the, in the 40s and early 50s that this proceeds. And that leads directly to the next stage, generativity versus stagnation. We really have to put together and start following things that feel like we're making a contribution to the culture in some way, that our lives are not just self-preoccupied. Uh, we will get very irritable and very distressed uh, if all it is is advantaging ourselves. We get very cranky. Trump is cranky all the time. It's all about making his own life richer and fuller yeah. and he has practically no uh, social interest whatsoever uh, and we have to start dealing with death in that era we are going to die what do we want to be remembered for what are we going to leave behind uh, that leads to the last stage ego integrity versus despair uh, we, could, we can enter our last uh, challenges getting ready to, for the fact we're dying in the next few years and feel that, all right, on the balance, I made some dumb mistakes. I did some awful things, but on the balance, my, uh, the sweep of my whole life has been reasonable and good, and I managed to make some things happen that were rather important. I've been a good friend, and i still married to the same woman, even though we fought like hell intermittently. And, Pride can be taken out of what's happening at the close of life. I, I once had an 82-year-old uh, woman show up my uh, office, and her opening statement to me was, my life is terrible, nothing has ever gone right for me, and I'm old, and I'm going to die from this diabetes, and I can't fix anything anymore. She was just lost in despair.
and I had to somehow undo that with her. So let's get into that. It's time for us to talk about some some case histories, if you will. Oh, all right. Yeah. So what did you do in that situation? Uh, oh, and she said, oh, I forgot. There was no Medicare back then. She said, I don't have any money to pay you. And I said, I don't need to be paid. I, I do some work here. You sound interesting. And I said, uh, you said nothing has ever gone right. Do you have some examples of things that have been terrible for you? And she said, uh, <clears throat> she had to flee uh, Hungary because several of her relatives were murdered in a pogrom, and she and her her uh, father and her brother had to flee uh, in the middle, of, and her mother had to flee in the middle of the night. And they had some family jewels that were worth something. They managed to sell the family jewels and get in steerage and come to the United States. And her father kept trying and trying and trying uh, to get work, and he, he could only get part-time labor once in a while. And she had to leave middle school and uh, go to work because she went into the garment industry and was sewing dresses long hours. To, so she supported the family. And her brother who came with them was profoundly retarded. And after her parents were dead, she had to inherit the responsibility of looking over her brother, too. And she was so busy and so tired. She had no time for dating. And she read voraciously. She loved reading in English. She was very fluent. She All she wanted to do was to be able to go to school, and going to school was never possible for her. Um, she met her husband at some Jewish function or another. I don't remember what. Uh, she, was, she was then about uh, 20, and uh, he was in medical school. He took a shining to her, and she was being practical. She felt found him a decent enough person, but she wasn't really romantically drawn to him. She didn't feel any surge of love, but he wanted to marry her. And uh, he said, uh, let me take you home to the East Coast to meet my family, and if they approve of you, can we get married? And she agreed. She agreed to get married because... Her father was getting on in years now, and she had a brother to support, and she was exhausted. And he came from a wealthy family, and he was going to be a physician, so she thought that was very practical and would be a, a good outcome for her. So she passed mother, they muster, they got married. She came back to Southern California because he, here he was where he was going to school, and he finished his, his uh, course of study, and he finished his internship, and he opened his practice, and then he began to have trouble seeing. So he went to a, an ophthalmologist, and he had some early progressive uh, eye disease. And within four years of his opening his practice, he was too blind to continue practicing uh, medicine. So she had him to have to take care of now. She had to go back to work. He managed to get a shitty job. He managed to get a shitty job with feel. He could seal packages. So he got a sh shitty job in a shipping department of a factory that made stuff, and he, he helped put them in cardboard boxes and made practically nothing. And she was trapped in a loveless marriage, and she still had her uh, brother to, to be responsible for. Uh, they had two children. She had a uh, son and a, uh, an older daughter. And then she said, my son died when he was eight years old. He died of leukemia. Do you want to see a picture of my son? And I said, of course, I'd be glad to see a picture of your son. And she told, pulled the picture out. It, was, uh, it had been in her wallet for years and years and years. And she started crying again as if he had just died yesterday when she took the picture out. She said, he was full of life. He loved everything. He, he died on Halloween. He was getting sicker and sicker, but he had always loved going trick-or-treating. And we had the candy by the door, and there was a hospital bed in the living room of our apartment. He asked if he could pass the candy out so the kids would come for candy, and he would give them some of the candy. We rolled the hospital bed up to the door, and... So he could do that. And, uh, he went to sleep that night and he was dead in the morning, she said. 
And my daughter, I don't know where my daughter is. She was the love of my life. And she was very bright. She got a scholarship to UCLA. And she was going there. And there was a guy uh, talking uh, to the crowd, assembled multitude on the, one of the pathways on campus. And she started living in, listening to him. And he was uh, a representative of Sun Young Moon. And uh, it sounded really interesting. She started going to local meetings of, of the movement, and she was convinced that her salvation lay in joining the, uh, the, the movement fully full time. And she was going to leave school and go off to Schenectady, New York, where he was located, and go to work for the headquarters. And she pleaded with you, your, my husband and I, that we should bring our son uh, and take him to and all of us go live in, in the commune there and we fought we said we're jewish we can't do something like that you're losing your mind please don't go and she got very angry with us and said she was leaving and she left and she corresponded with with us for a while and then after a while we got a letter from her saying She's come to the conclusion that we contaminate her, that we, we are evil, and she can't have any further relationship. You know, let me just insert here, a lot of people may not have heard of, uh, of Moon, and this was what was widely regarded uh, as a cult. And yeah. one of those situations where people had to uh, forswear, forsake their, all their relatives, and give as much of their money to the cult as, <laughs> as was humanly possible. So... You've laid out this story that she gave you with so much complexity and stuff. Your question to her was, well, where have you been a failure? What's what's the big failure that puts so you in despair? Sure, but what is what is what is the terrible disappointment she's had? Yeah. After she finished and cried about several of them, I said, all right, you need to come back and I, I'll see you without paying you. I'll be happy to see you. And she said, could I bring you some pine cones for your fireplace? I feel really bad about not giving you anything. And I said, of course you can bring me some pine cones for my fireplace. Mm-hmm. And she said, once in a while when I cook, I have a little left over. Do you, do you like stuffed cabbage? And I said, yes, <laughs> you can bring me some food if you want to. I said, I have a different assignment for you today. Uh, I said, I'm sure that you've had some moments when you felt life was worthwhile. And I got her to talk to me about something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found out something astonishing. Uh, What was astonishing was that she had uh, lied about having a high school diploma. Nobody ever asked her for it. And she had gotten a job as a clerk in the mayor of Los Angeles' office. She got a civil service job. That's, That's what was supporting the family. She had just recently retired when I started to see her. And uh, she was obviously bright and capable. And they kept giving her more and more assignments of greater complexity. And she took on uh, more responsibility increasingly. And in the last five or six years of, of working in the mayor's office, she was her the mayor's go-to person. She was like a personal assistant to him. If he had a complex political dilemma he was struggling with, she she was the one that he would call and try and process it with. And she knew how, how significantly important she was to him. That gave her a great deal of uh, pleasure. She was also wonderful with plants. Uh, uh, she... One of the things that made her sad was they had recently moved into senior citizen housing. And in the apartment building where she was before, she had lots of room. There was a common courtyard in it. And the landlord was happy if she wanted to plant plants and take care of them. And she did. She made the place very beautiful. But she was miserable because of that. And she still had as many plants growing inside as she possibly could. And... uh, I began to think of things that I could do. I said, you, you are not, your life is not over. Uh, you say there's nothing between you and your husband. You don't even talk to each other very much. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm sure he has his own pain. I'd like to try something. I'd like you to bring him in 
it might be possible for me to establish some greater kindness between the two of you if, uh, if I add him here too. You don't necessarily have to be as lonely as you are for the rest of your life. And I said, I happen to know uh, there is a, a nursery, a uh, huge nursery up in Malibu, and they have plants from all over the world, and they think of themselves as a holding place uh, to prevent plants from becoming extinct, and they really want volunteers to come and help tend the plants, to water them and prune them occasionally. Could you take the bus all the way from where you are to where they are? Because I know you don't drive anymore. I think they would welcome you if you came and wanted to do something. And you love plants, so there are plants from all over the world there. So she started doing that activity. And wonder of wonders, she loved it, and they loved her. She was really, uh, she had a good fit with the people who owned the place and was enjoying that as a regular activity in her life now. Yeah. I I found something for her to be generative about again. Uh-huh. I was successful with a husband and wife. Uh, uh, he, he was just closed down in his own grief about his loss of capacity. I got him to cry about his blindness, and she comforted him. And I said, your wife is very lonely. Can you go to a movie ever? She's missing going to the movies. You have enough hearing and eyesight that you could enjoy a movie. So he agreed to take her to a movie occasionally. I said, could you take a walk and could you hold her hand while you walk? And he said he could do that. And uh, he actually spontaneously, after he started doing that, said, wait a minute, while he was walking with her, holding her hand, and he gave her a kiss. He hadn't given her a kiss in 20 years. Yeah, so yeah. That, that started to get softer and better, too. And she was very appreciative of the time she was spending with me. And then a miracle happened. There are miracles in this world. She got a uh, phone call from her daughter. It had been seven years, I think, since she had had any contact. The daughter apologized profusely and said that she's so sorry that she was so stupid and had dropped out of her mother's life and believed that she had found the, the road to salvation. She had married the chief technology officer in the cult. And he had been coming to the same conclusion. So in secret, they had been plotting and planning. They were going to make a jailbreak out of there. And just as mother had had to leave the pogrom, oh, uh, my client was told that she had two grandchildren, a little, a little baby boy and a girl age. So the family split in the middle of the night and ran for their lives and... Uh, he had managed secretly to get a job uh, in uh, Baltimore. He had a technology job in Baltimore, and they had established themselves. And the daughter said, all I want is to make up to you for all the hurt I've caused you. Can we, We're we making nice money here in Baltimore. There are light in many apartment buildings not too far from us. Could I move the two of you out of Los Angeles, and would you come to Baltimore? So you can be with your new son-in-law and your grandchildren uh, over the rest of the years of your life. And that's what she did. She moved to Baltimore and said hi to me. Well, what would you say your role in this flowering of her life was? I, I knew something. I, I took her complaint seriously. And I knew something because of my own experience with other clients and my life experience about how I could talk to her and how I could get her to begin to engage with things that would fill in the aridity in her soul and nourish her instead of uh, leave her so depleted. Do you, would it be fair to ask you, do you Wait, have... Wait, quote Freud. Huh? quote Freud. I didn't think of Freud at the time, but yeah. he said the two most important things are love and work. And I managed to give those both back to her. I managed to give her work to do that had meaning for her. And I gather I managed to give some love coming again from her husband. How would you describe your theory of change? Oh, to it, well, that's what I'm into right now. Uh, when I see a new client, I have two eyes. One of them looks to what is the individual life cycle stage that seems to be where the stuckness is and is causing trouble. And with the other eye, we haven't talked about this yet, I do an assessment of where in the family life cycle, the, their family in which they're embedded is stuck. Uh, 
Because mm -hmm. the stuckness may come from one of those sources, the other of those sources, or both of them. Okay. And for each of them, there are implications for what the work is that needs to be done. Okay. And uh, can you say more about the work that needs to be done? The work that needs to be done is to provide experiences that break the impasse that they're stuck in or give them in the therapy experience itself what they didn't have in the preceding stage because the first five of those stages I have a whole other handout it's called good enough parenting it's important that parents watch over the children as they struggle with each of these core conflicts over the first five stages when they're at home and uh, if parents uh, I'll stop that sentence and go back to something else. Okay. We are very, very fragile in the beginning. So if things go bad in the beginning, they're much more wounding than if they, if they, uh, for some things going bad later on. I like to think of life as being like a river journey. If you go, you know what the continental divide is. It sounds like something I should know what it is. <laughs> you didn't take geography. Is it, is it the Mississippi River? No, the Continental Divide is a line drawn across the top of the Rocky Mountains. Okay. It, all water that rains down on the Rocky oh. Mountains, if, if, the, if it rains down on the east side of the Continental Divide, the, the water drops will eventually wind up in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic, and if they drop on the uh, on the west side of the continental divide they'll wind up in the pacific ocean okay. so theoretically if you were to stand on the continental divide with a cup of water in your hands and you poured it out facing north with your left hand all that water would go into the pacific ocean and if you poured it out with your right hand all that water would go into the uh, atlantic ocean so our lives are like a river journey Rivers in the beginning are rivulets dripping off of glaciers. They're very small. And a tiny deflection and where, where the little puddles and stream of water is going can have enormous difference on where it winds up later on. But it goes down to lower elevations. It merges with other rivers. And its course is set. The direction is set. And if you drop an atomic bomb on the, uh, where the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico... Yes, of course, you deform the river some. You might leave a huge crater that moved the river somewhere else temporarily or permanently. But it would still be essentially in the same place. You wouldn't have affected the, uh, the, the course of the river as much as if you threw it off course early on. And that's what we're like. At each stage, as we master the preceding challenge, we're acquiring more from the outside world. We're becoming more complex and a little bit sturdier. So... Thing, things that would drive us nuts when we were infants are quite manageable by the time we get to our, our adulthood. Yeah. So we've been talking for about an hour, and typically this is around how long I would wrap things up. But I don't want this to end with you feeling like there are all these important things that I never got to. One more for about 10 minutes, probably. Okay. That's the family life cycle. Because as I said, I'm looking at my clients with two lenses. Mm -hmm. Here it is. I'm indebted to uh, two uh, family psychologists named Carter and McGoldrick. They published a book uh, called The Changing Family Life Cycle. What was the second name, Carter, and who? Mick Goldrick, M-C-G-O-L-D-R-I-C-K. Okay. I use it as a textbook. I, 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 I used... Uh, uh, well, as I taught developmental psychology more and more, I used Erickson and the book that they wrote as my textbooks in my class. Mm -hmm. The family life cycle has six stages. The six stages are, first, the first one is the death of the preceding family. It's leaving home, single young adults. Uh, the old family is transformed because somebody is leaving and now they're alone. They their challenge is going to be to create the new family as they move on. The second stage is securing intimate relationship, coupling and its alternatives. The third one is families with young children. The fourth one is families with adolescents. The fifth one is launching children and moving on. And the last one is families in later life. Now, 
what Carter and McGoldrick do is wonderful because they have a chart. I'm I'm plugging my computer and it's getting low. They pro they provide the reader with a chart, and uh, in the center of the chart is the key principles of transition. What has to happen in order for the person to get through the challenges of that life cycle uh -huh, and to move on? Yeah, and and in the right hand column. Here are things the therapist can look at that will facilitate the moving on. So leaving home, for instance, how can one get established properly in leaving home? The first thing is they have to differentiate themselves in relation to the family of origin. What that means is the family of origin and the young person now have to have not a dominant and different relationship, but a, re a relationship of mutuality where nobody is giving unsolicited advice to the other and trying to control each other. So the person leaving home, hopefully the parents will be wise and not make this a lot of work, but most parents are not wise about that. <laughs> and the young person has to make work to make that change in the dynamic. The second thing is the development of peer relationships. People leaving home need a good peer network because they're not getting their intimacy satisfied but by their parents anymore. They need a good friendship network where some of it will be provided to them. And finally, the development of themselves with regard to work and financial independence. Uh, unfortunately, if you remain financially dependent on your parents, too often you wind up having to be deferent to them and in their control. So it's very important to establish that. And that's what therapists can work on, those three things. If they see somebody floundering in that era to try and make those three happen, to advocate for them, to suggest ways to make them happen. So there is a template of what the protocol is if you see somebody stuck. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, that's a good overview, I think, that you've given us some uh, a better understanding of what it is to be a, a developmental coach and consultant. Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, you, you, Make an assessment that's not a medical assessment, right. and you do have from the literature a variety of strategies you can follow to heal what the developmental impasse is all about. Okay. And it doesn't stigmatize anybody. Right, right. Yeah, I get that. And uh, so that's so you can be uh, like the kindly uncle. If oh, yes. I, I often tell my graduate students, we're, we're like a secular priesthood. That's what we are. Uh -huh. We are the tribal elders. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a good place for us to wrap it up, I think. And thank you for your time and attention. Yeah. And for yeah. Giving me access to some audience unknown. Yes, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And if people want to know more about you and your work and so on, where would you direct them? Oh, they can uh, look at my website, which is arthurkovacs.com, or they can, uh, if they want to email me, I'm glad to receive an email from them. And that's my initials, A-L Kovacs, K-O-V-A-C-S, at AOL.com. Okay, wonderful. Well, Dr. Art Kovacs, I want to thank you again for being my guest on Shrink Wrap Radio. Oh, I always love being able to talk about things that are important to me.